the picture that you've painted of European atheism and the growth of it, um, I see a lot of the same factors in the last 15 years or so, um, you know, happening again. And I think, uh, you know, 9-11 was a real flashpoint for new atheism. And, and in a way, new atheism became, while old atheism, you could say, was a bulwark against Christianity, um, and it focused on Christianity and it even weaponized Islam to use against the state, the church. Um, in the modern era, because we have a globalized culture, you don't, you don't now point to um, the, uh, the evils of the church in France as a, state, as a state actor. Today, people point to Saudi Arabia. And so because of this globalized culture, now kind of uh, is- so-called Islamic cultures, so-called Islamic states, were, which are you know, theocratic, dictatorial, often backed by Western uh, states historically as well, um, they are now the flashpoint of new atheism. And new atheism is now a weapon and being used. And those arguments of science are being deployed against uh, Islam in particular. Um, is that something that you have, have recognized and you have seen and you, can, you recognize it as happening in today's world? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. So if you were to... <clears throat> want to pithily crystallise your atheistic arguments in France, middle of the 18th century, you might take the fact that there were still people being executed, indeed, I think also being tortured for confessional crimes. In other words, for a a crime against a Catholic state or Catholic for being executed. If you want any better reason why at the very least, you should be anti-clerical, probably anti-Christian and maybe anti-God. That's your example. Nowadays, it is no accident that the popular atheist slogan of the last 15 years or so is, what is it, science flies people to the moon, religion flies people into buildings. Obviously, everyone mm. knows what's going on there. That's your sound bite. That crystallises what science is capable of doing and what religion actually does. Now, like all sound bites, it doesn't bear a moment's exaggeration, but rhetorically, it's mm. hugely powerful. Mm. And where do you see things going uh, in the West in particular uh, in terms of belief? Do you think new, new, new atheism has completely won the day, or do you think there are other emerging trends now? Well, new atheism has, has really faded, really. We were launched at CEOS a month after the God Delusion was published, and for a good few years or so, was everywhere and it was the kind of the atmosphere in which we lived. Um, what struck me particularly when writing the book, and, and the book came out five years ago now, was how many atheists are determined to distance themselves from new atheism. Mm. Um, the, I think it was the Rationalist or the Skeptic magazine, I can't remember which it was, had an editorial effectively entitled Richard Dawkins is a, is a, is a subject lesson how not to do it. Mm. So I don't think new atheism has been successful in, in, in that regard. There's alienated as many people as it has attracted. The trends in the Western world are a growing disaffiliation for institutional religion, institutional Christianity, mm. a growing uh, embrace of um, atheism, not new atheism in that sense, but people just believe in God, but also a growing and certainly changing set of beliefs around what you might do to call spirituality. Mm. Spiritual, not religious. Yeah. Absolutely, that's the category. Which we have a podcast video on. <laughs> yeah, we do. It's, 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 a, it's, a, growing, it's a growing topic. And, and you, know, you, you will find people who uh, disparage any form of institutional, particularly institutional, that's the bad word, institutional religious yeah. affiliation, but are much happier and even prepared to advocate for bespoke, ad hoc, personalised spiritual beliefs. Mm which are tailored to my particular concerns. Yeah. Mm. So in, in some ways, interestingly, where the debate 300 years ago between science and religion was actually just caught up, or no, something between religion and atheism, was caught up in the context of wars of religion, and mm. that's what shapes it. Today, the same debate is caught up in these more pluralizing, secularizing trends. It's not a straightforward battle. It never is a straightforward battle one way or the other. It's always situated in the particular context of the moment. And isn't it interesting, I think, that one thing that you know really struck me was how you talked about France and England and how to be English was not to be French because of the French-English wars. 
And that resulted in two different attitudes towards uh, pluralism and, and people's different beliefs. In the UK, you know, it was much more pluralistic. In, the, in France, it was much more intolerant of anti-Catholic views. And actually, you know, you see those trends in the manifestation of secularism to this day between France and England. I mean, in France, you have the burqa ban. You have the, um, the what's the, uh, the swimsuit Muslim women wear? Burkini. The burkini ban, right? And you have legislation against it. Um, and in England, that's not even really conceivable, actually, still to this day. So we're still feeling those repercussions. Oh, absolutely. Centuries later. That's right. Although um, the, the, the kind of the footnote to that is that the reason for France's laissez-faire um, is uh, we haven't talked about France in the 19th century and the, the pendulum swings between a more secular Republican state and more royalists. Um, Catholic states in France in the 19th century. But you're right, you know, you, you, you can trace it, trace it all the way back. The state of secularism today is really interesting. Um, there's a book recently come out, which I've not yet read, but I, I intend to, about struggles that secularism is having in Turkey and mm. in India. Um, we talked about France. In one sense, um, there are issues around it in America mm. as well. Um, it's partly because there are different kinds of secularism. Yep. There's a, the, the, what's sometimes called the programmatic secularism of France, in which secularism acts like a bouncer at a club, which says, you're not going in. <laughs> and then it acts as a state religion, actually. In yeah. many ways, yeah, that's right. But it, 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 it's, it's there to prevent the entrance of religious views and practices into public life. Mm. You have the procedural secularism which is closer to what, in theory, you get in the American model, where secularism acts as a referee, mm. which says you're allowed to come in, you're allowed to come on the pitch as long as you play by the same rules. Mm. And the more programmatic the form of secularism you get, the more likely it seems that you're provoking a reaction from religious people. So Muslims in France is quite an example. You feel as if they're citizens, but almost second class citizens. Mm. because I'm allowed to bring my, much of my kind of political views, say, into public debate, when it comes to my religious views. Actually, when it comes to things that matter most to me, be quiet. Mm. And that is not a recipe for a contented society. To be clear, the opposite is very messy. Mm. Yeah. When you invite everyone onto the pitch, and then you've got to get this messy business of policing, yeah. no easy options here. Yeah. The programmatic secularism, which is in many ways the kind of grandchild of the stuff we've been talking about, that has its challenges too.